Hi, everybody. Ricky here from Behind the Bars TV. And today's guest is a fellow who a lot of you will probably know. He's already been on the podcast before. Well, me and Kev go back to 2006 when I first met him in HMP Franklin. But, Kev, if you'd just like to introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Sorry, my name's Kevin Lane. Uh, I served a 20 year sentence for murder. I have been in prison for kidnapping as well, although it wasn't the same offence. Uh, I've now been released into society and I'm currently launching a new product into this country in in uh, a new new design for, for a home using modern methods of construction. So that's where I'm at now. Uh, here to tell you, I'm in a bit of work gear, so you'll have to just suffer that. <laughs> well, Kev, it's nice to see you on. Today. Nice to see you out and nice to see you're doing well because yeah, that's what this channel, channel is all about. It's about interviewing ex-prisoners who are out doing good for themselves, turn their lives around and showing people that just because we've been to prison doesn't mean we're bad people or it's the end of the line. No, absolutely. The, the thing is, let's, so I went to prison for contract killing. Um, I don't mean this egotistically. I'll give it to you as it is. Um, I was labelled the number one contract killer in the country, a hundred thousand pound a hit. Um, I think they were talking about when the old woman used to hit me, not the other <laughs> way around. Um, <laughs> as you know, Ricky, I was in Franklin with you, um, I was triple category A, and people have got to stop saying I'm talking bollocks. Triple category A existed, exceptional risk existed. I was held at exceptional risk, AAA, whilst on remand with the IRA godfathers, uh, Andy Russell, Wayne Hohen, God rest his soul, he's dead now, I don't believe in God, but it's a saying. Um, and other people of his ilk, like um, the Notch Biz safe, safe robber, Valerio Valici, they were at exceptional risk at one time. And a few others, of course. I was downgraded through the system, came onto the mains, and I met you in Franklin, Ricky, didn't I? You did, I, but you, you were still cut here when I was in Franklin with you. It was when I left, you got downgraded, didn't you, to Cat B? Yeah, I got Cat B. Um, so through that journey, I obviously became friends with Charlie, as many other people did, because Charlie's only excitement of the day, or of the month, or of the months, should I say, was a trip to another block areas in the control unit. Um, you got Your connection went a bit funny there, Kev. I understand how or why the, the documentary was edited in the manner that it was. And it's to show that, yeah, I have been a violent man in the past. I'm capable of violence, but controlled violence. I'm capable of defending myself whilst using force. What happened was in the documentary, and uh, I'm somewhat to blame for that, because I quite clearly said, uh, yes, this is me in society. Basically saying, if they can have me in society, why can't they have Charlie? Yeah, It's somewhat different, of course, Rick, because when we're talking about my, myself and you included, and millions of other men in this country, would do exactly the same as what I would do and you would do if they was faced with the same set of consequences or, or same set of uh, uh, problems that we could be faced with. If, yeah. Yet we would be targeted as a dangerous, violent man, whereas the ordinary bystander would be considered a hero for standing up for his family or standing up for some innocent bystander or whatever. Yeah. That's what we're, that's the difficulty that we have as convicted prisoners. So I've come home from prison, I've set up a business, and I'm a law abiding citizen. However, I have to be mindful every single day and do a risk assessment of where I go, who I may be going with, and who I mix with because of my life sentence. And like you've just mentioned, because life license, it feels like you're walking on eggshells, like you've just mentioned. But for the viewers, what Kev, what you're referring to there was, Kev, for some of them that might not have seen the documentary, 
were you referring to the way you might have come across at the end of that documentary? Yeah, because I get up at one point and I clearly got the bleeding on. But what people don't know is when I had my houses delivered that day, <laughs> there was tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage to them that I unwrapped to find out. Could you imagine how I felt? Well, <laughs> anyone would be annoyed at that, wouldn't they? I was gutted, <laughs> devastated. And that, that then I had to take the interview after seeing my home that I've designed. I've flown to Turkey. I've seen it in its finished uh, glory to be transported into England, delivered in the meadow for the crows to break holes in the in the in the Stremford polis uh, wrapping, pierced holes in it, and then we had a downpour in October, which everyone might recall or might not recall. And of course, it brought all of my ceilings down in my brand new barn. So I was devastated. I then took the interview whilst feeling devastated, and then my my friends and workers. They was obviously having a jovial time outside the interview. And they'd been asked once to, come on, lads, keep it down. Yeah. And then it happened again. So that made me look aggressive. Uh, and it made me look like I was having a go at my children. Well, I wasn't. But that's what they do with these documentaries, don't they? Like, they do so much filming and they take bits out like they want to. And you've got no control over how they're going to make you look, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, I've got, I'm going to have more control over it in future. I did that last summer, that uh, documentary. It was two days worth of filming. To be fair, some of the questions that were being put to me, I knew the nature of that question and where it was going. And for instance, when I said, and you are in society, and I went, yes, as if to say, I, I can be violent and I'm in society. But it didn't look too clever. But I thought, I'm going to answer this for the benefit of Charlie. And I might have to take a bit on the chin here, which I have done. But nonetheless, I think the the pod, the the documentary has got the backing of the country, predominantly. Yeah. For the sake of that. This is what I've said. Charlie's done 48 years. In that 48 years... How many paedophiles and rapists or people have committed acts on the vulnerable have been in prison and released? Rearrested, in prison and released. So they might have been in and out three or four times, okay? And they say it's half a million people in 48 years have been in and out. We know it's a lot more than that, okay? Yeah. But over 48 years, if... Uh, Half a million offenders have been in and out of prison. How many lives have they destroyed? Hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah, they keep being allowed back into society. Exactly. That's my argument. But also in that documentary, which a lot of people have been mentioning, how do you think, or what do you think about Charles' son, the way he come across George? Because they made him look quite bad at the end, didn't it, with what the... Uh when he referred to, to, when they asked him, what do you think would it be like when he's released and he comes to live with you? And the way that George answered that question made it look like he wasn't on his side. Yeah. So I can understand why people feel that that way and they're quite, quite rightly so. Some might say, though, however, that was George being objective. Other people might say there's been objective and there's been a little bit naive. Whereas it's your father, you could have been a little bit more reserved in that. Look, he may a little blow up, but to say he could stab us with a bread knife, I think he regrets that now. I haven't spoken to him. Yeah. Okay, I received a phone call from him after the first. Uh, Part one was show that evening. Okay, I was in bed going to sleep, and he called me, and he called me into relation to being recalled to prison, not recalled, but it's always on my brain. Uh, sent to prison for filming the Zoom calls with Charlie. It's an imprisonable offence. 
Right. He said, look, I will get trouble in prison. And I said, listen, if you get banged up, I'll come up and see you the first week. I'm bound to know people in the prison or know someone. I can't see you getting any egg. But by that time, I hadn't seen episode two. Right. Part two. <laughs> uh, I would I would wait to take Charlie's findings on this and a few other people. I'm not going to lambast George for what he did uh, until the smoke settles. That's for sure. Because Rick, you've done them courses where you see a skinhead walking down the road and and a gentleman walks past him with a briefcase and a crumbie. Do you remember that one? Oh, and I the remember. skinhead turns around and runs at him and grabs the man, not and pulls him to the side. It looks like he's robbing him. But as he's knocked him to the side, what you don't see is there's a crane above and Drop the pallet's him. dropping. Yeah. But what you get fed to begin with is what you what you work off of. And I feel that's what's happened here with Charlie. So I'm going to stay somewhat reserved still and then see what comes out in the in the in the in the smoke. Because then if the, if the parole board watching that and seeing that his son said that, it's just not going to look good at all, is it? If his son's saying he's, he's scared and the wife's scared. But I think yeah. it's the way they've brought it across. He hasn't meant it in a bad way because obviously he loves his father. He wants him out. But it, they've made him look bad, I think. I agree. I agree that it could have been handled a little bit different. But the <clears> editing's <throat> always... It's a marvellous thing editing. I mean, look, I've done a podcast, right, and I was naked. It said I had a 12-inch cock. The what? <laughs> Nine inches. <laughs> <laughs> but it was edited to make me look 12 inches. in the show, so. Kevin, it was only two. Yeah, yeah, you know, the old catwalk, Kev. Some editing can be quite good. <laughs> uh, but look, Let's just rewind a little bit. I would have been a product of the system in that if I hadn't been in the special secure units, I would have gone into the mainstream segregation and there would have been reception committees waiting for me for whatever offence I had just done. Mine was always hitting bully screws or yeah. idiots, you know, not idiots, but fucking arseholes on the wings, you know. But... When I first came away, I was in a screw a month and fighting my mufti and such, you know. <laughs> so if I'd have been on the mainstream, I'd have been going around on the merry-go-round like Charlie. Yeah. And like Charlie, I'd have gone, as soon as I get better, or as soon as I get a chance, I'm going to get one of you. For what you've done to me, I'd still be in prison now. Of course, so. But yeah, I've, because I was in the special secure unit, you have to be clear to work in the special secure unit. The only time that other staff can come onto that unit is when the alarm bell goes off. And then they bang up everybody in the outside of the unit in the mainstream prison. And there were ever many staff are on there. They go, right, two off, three off. And off they go running, don't they? And come to the unit. But um, I, if I'd have sorted a member of staff in the unit, which I, I, I sorted, I'd say we had uh, an irreversible decision, a set of circumstances, should I say, that can only be resolved in having yeah. to tear up with the screws, regrettably. Uh, I would only see those staff again that I've had the fight with. Right, so... so they didn't go over the top. They just wrapped you up, zip-tied you. I only ever had one screw go off the top, and his name was Harry Mirza, and they moved him out of the unit when I came back there, sent him on escorts for 28 days. He <laughs> must have dated him. <laughs> but he was a bully. He stood on a well... Uh, there's a friend of mine in North London, and he's a, he's a member of a family, well-known family. I haven't got his permission, so I'm not going to use his name. But this also Harry Mirza, stood on his neck in the block whilst he's being bent up. Yeah. He then passed, we used to get trays, plastic trays, and they used to be handed to you at your cell door, and then they give you the tray, and then they pull your door up. Well... He's handed a tray to a gentleman called Farney Quinn. Farney's now an established artist. But when he's given the tray, he's then punched him. So he's handing his food to Farney Quinn at the door. So you take your tray. When he's took the tray, this bleeding Harry Mers has hit him. 
I come in back to the unit. I said, well, uh, I, and he come for me, this Abbey geezer did. I was on a visit. He come with uh, four screws to take me off a visit. It's only meant to be two to escort me back. I'm in the unit. I ain't going anywhere. He came back with four screws set about me. Two of them went to hospital. I, just, I mean, and two had a few bruises on them, but I was in the block in a strip cell. All my ligaments in my arm were ripped where he had to be rugby tackled off of me on camera. And when it came to the camera footage, it had been the camera weren't working. Oh, typical. <laughs> and I had my arm in a sling for six weeks where he ripped all the ligaments in my arm when I was CNR in me, but he was standing the other side of my head this way and pulling my arm back past my head. That's what he was trying to do. Oh, so, right. I, you know, and he got rugby tackled off of me. And then he left the job in the end. I don't know why. Wow. That's the type of thing you got to put up with in them units or in the blocks. Not Kev, good. where where was it like you met Charlie and when was it? Whitemore, Belmarsh, Franklin Blocks. All in the blocks. Have you ever been on the wings with him? No, because he was always in the control centres and then I was in special secure units. The only time I met Charlie was when I was in Belmarsh unit. He was in the block there. I was in the block. He was, I was in the block. He was on. He was in the wing to begin with. Uh, and then he took the little the Iranian hostages, didn't he? Oh, I read. Oh. And he made him tickle his feet. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Can I just say, I know. I mean, I don't know this gentleman who was in Hull, the art teacher, or whatever he was. Oh, right He's not worked, he has not worked a single day in 21 years, so he says. I can tell you now, looking at him, he seems to me like he could work from home. He could do something. Oh, definitely. No disrespect for the gentleman. I think he's a scrounger. He's scrounging off the government. Yeah. 21 years later... I bet he can go down the pub and have a drink still without any worries. Right? Yeah. Uh, no one says on anything the, about him. Is that what he was saying on his documentary that he hadn't worked since then? 21 years. 21 years. Like well, I looked saying... at him and thought, he looked, he said, oh, I'm suffering and all the rest of it. I thought, yeah, of course you are, mate. This country's got too many people are suffering when they ain't really suffering and they're on the old bleeding drip. And yeah. he's one of them, in my opinion. Why don't people look at him and think you're a fucking scrounger? No offence, don't mean it like that, but the truth is, that man could be doing something to earn his living in this country. Not blaming poor old Charlie. When on that video, you can clearly see he's laughing when he's walking around there. Yeah. You have a look at that video, he's laughing. He's milked the country... For every single penny for what Charlie did. Didn't arm him, didn't hurt him. Bone cat, such as whether it's films. I'm gonna we're gonna be putting some clips up soon. And we're gonna put a little a little not Snapchat, but a few little clips in relation to the good that Charlie's done. Yeah. Such as the millions of pounds that he's earned from people. The, the hundreds of thousands of pounds he's raised for charities. Through his artwork and everything. I know for a fact, Charlie, he did a drawing for a young boy. There was only, I think, three or five people in the world with this disease. And I was raising money for this boy. Charlie came into the fold and he did something for him as well. Now that boy, young boy's father was a police officer. He was a, a traffic uh, cyclist police officer, okay? But you can't start differentiating who you, you show kindness to because of what that person's profession might be. Charlie didn't bat an eyelid. He picked his pen up, bang, and off he went. And that raised money for that young boy whose father was a a motorbike a cyclist police officer. These things don't get shown, do they? 
But that's the thing. They're always just trying to show the bad about you. They don't like, because you've done bad, they don't like to see you doing good. And they don't like to praise you to the... <laughs> well, one. I know you like your food. <laughs> on, <then>. Big <laughs> <Ricky> Colleen! <laughs> it makes me look like a mushroom. Is that much bigger than me? <laughs> so... I really feel for Charlie because, as that psychologist said, it's zero percent of reoffending at the age of seventy. Oh, crazy. And I think Charlie just wants to be put in the countryside, away from people. This is my opinion: peace and tranquility, not humans that yeah. have different behavioural problems in their own entirety. But again. When Charlie gets out, if he went and done something like that, someone like yourself would be able to help him go out in the countryside. Maybe you would go around, see him, help him. But this sort of thing, the probation probably wouldn't allow it, would they? I hope not. I, I think Charlie should go to Warren Hill. And he can be released from Warren Hill straight into society. Yeah. You can skip the decal. And there's a certain type of ilk of prisoner in there. I'm going to, he's already had a, 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 a crowd bank or whatever they're called. I forget what they're called now. Set up to. Oh, the crowdfunding. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm in discussions with a company at the moment. I've got just been granted 700 million pound in this country. They've got a factory here in this country and they're producing homes that I've designed. Um, we're currently in negotiation in relation to my homes and me working. So I've spoken to this, my supply chain, a company that I'm currently negotiating with. And we are prepared to set up a charity. Not me, I'm not having, I, I will, I won't be at the helm. The £700 million company will be at the helm and we will supply a home for Charlie at cost through the fundraiser and it will be a beautiful home with space that he's not used to living in. In terms of he needs to have space, he needs to have a nice bedroom, he needs to have a bathroom, living room, dining room. He's lived in one room, as we know, for 48 years. Yeah. And possibly put him on a little piece of land somewhere where he is away from people and he can pick and decide where he wants to go, when he wants to come out without having people harass him. Yeah. So we're looking at that at the moment. And it, it's, I, I think it's an option for Charlie to, to be released, hopefully a little bit more securely. Because that'll be a massive problem for him when he's out. If he's living amongst loads of people, he's just going to get constantly harassed, isn't he? The press, the paparazzi yeah. going to be following him, everyone, and it's just going to be too much, isn't it? So, Charlie, there's a few things that people have to try and understand about where Charlie's been and how he behaves. So, he answered a few questions, such as... Um, do you have any regrets? But Charlie, you have, no, he has no regrets. That's his life. So he's lived his life. What Charlie might have wanted to say is, but he can't because he's not, he's not been used to um, showing such emotion. Yeah. He's been used to being battered and punished. So you become hardened. Yeah. So he won't say, I regret what I've done. He will say, that's my life. I've had to get on with it. Okay. But behind that, Charlie would say, well, I wouldn't want to cause anybody any real harm unless they absolutely deserved it. But he hasn't got that in him to say that at the moment because of where he's lived for so yeah. long. So people must be a little bit more mindful about some of his answers. What he did to say there was, I've got no regrets. That's my life. I say this, life shuffles the cards and we have to play with the best hand that we're dealt. Yeah. I've had a hard, a hard uh, uh, 
I've had a few dodgy hands. And I've had to play with them hands. That's what I would have said. But people need to try and understand why he answers in the way he does. Exactly. Not quite... Like you see a place where he's at. You become hardened. You've got to be hardened. And you shut your emotions off because obviously because of what you're going through. So he's obviously going to come back with answers like that, isn't he? Yeah, and he may not mean any offence by that. He may not um, mean to be so so cold. What he's just saying is that that's the life I've led. That's what was dealt with me. I've got on with it. You put Charlie a few years into society, listening to the birds, walking in the country, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and it will sharp it will round the sharpened edges. He won't yeah. be so sharp. He'll be more approachable in terms of his conversation. He may have a different thought pattern because he's now thinking about things differently in a nice environment, not a concrete coffin. And then your thought pattern is blinkered. So yeah. they want him to show emotion. He shows his emotion and his frustrations in his paintings. He's misguided in his early years of his prison sentence. I mean, Charlie would admit that. He's admitted it to me. He said, look, my crimes have pretty silly really he said and I've served a ridiculous amount of time in prison for them so he's already admitted that when he can put his pen to paper so that might be a different thought pattern as how he gets his words out and that's all because of the sentence oh. and that's yeah, all because exactly. he got, was it a discretionary like sentence he got yeah yeah so it's just like a lot of the lads that's in now on the IPPs there's going to be hundreds of Charlie Bronsons in the next 30 years because they're never going to get out unless they sort that sentence out of it. There's already hundreds of them now. Yeah. Why do you think the segregation units are bursting at the seams? Well, other because might... of the IPC system. Um, that's we're overcrowded. That's we're the same sentence what Charles was serving, isn't it? Same sort of sentence yeah. what Charlie was so serving. Let's look at Norway. Exactly that. Let's have a look at Norway. That gentleman who killed, I say gentleman, that man who killed all those students. Do you know the judges shake that man's hand? That's what they do in that country. The judges introduce themselves to that gentleman, they shake their hands. And Norway's got more of a forgiveness attitude than the punishment. However, they have the lowest rate of reoffending in Europe. They have the lowest crime rate and they have the best economy. What are they doing right that we are doing wrong? Why do we follow America and Canada, do courses such as the essential thinking skills? They started that in England. Ten years after they started it in Canada, they were writing in the papers that it's a failed course. And yet we still continued on that path with that course. Yeah, and they just keep changing the Why name. Why don't we follow the... Changing the name bit. Why don't we follow the, the countries that seem to have... Success with their reoffending and success with their rehabilitation. Why do we adopt countries such as America and Canada who seem to be failing? Just a field system, and it's like it's just mentioned things aren't working. It should be things need to be put differently to help the reoffending rate. Because the Absolutely. lads in prison at the minute, they're just getting off their heads, coming out and not not changing, just going straight back to what they were doing. So I, I currently, I'm working with a number of people in relation to providing a little communities for people to be re released from prison, such as you'll have five or six people, they will be given a one bedroom house, they'll be put into training for a qualified skill, whichever that may be, yeah. whichever takes their fancy, of course. And they'll be reintegrated back into society. These will be long serving prisoners, of course. It's projects such as that that are being kick started by members of the public, not government backing. They will get backing for the funding, and these are people who are taking these ideas forward themselves. And it's a worry when you think of that the criminal justice system, the system is designed in a manner where you can continue to tread water. You don't go anywhere. And that's a worry. 
like you've just mentioned, a lot of these things that are getting set up to help ex-prisoners and to help people with mental health and stuff. It's all people that have been there, like myself, yourself, coming out, ex-prisoners, setting things up to help other people when it should be government funded or someone higher up helping people, not ex-prisoners coming out, trying to help people and not getting any help from the government for it. Yeah, so I'm going, I can't give their names at the moment, but these are serving MPs. Um, and I've already had a discussion with one already. And uh, the company that I'm working with, with the 700 million, they're massive for putting money back into the community. Um, so we're going to be looking at that and what we can do for the prison system and what we can do for releasing, I would say, long-termers at the moment who have nothing to look, nothing to come home to. They've got no future but doom and gloom. My friend Kenny Collins, he's been home a year nearly. He hasn't had a penny off the state. Can't get a penny. It's, it's terrible. That man there trying to get something sorted out. He's 82 and there's lots of men in his position People say we well, he doesn't deserve any money off the state. They took all his money. People think he's got money. They've robbed him. Took every single penny off him. Like he robbed that, they've robbed him. It's yeah. just they do it legally, he done it out legally. They took a lot more off him than what he got. And then they've left him destitute. And they've not even given him his disability or his pension. So it's it's a farce. But there's quite a few people in his predicament that need assistance and guidance. And a little bit of nurturing. Yeah. Because so otherwise they just go straight back. Like you say, once they get out, they can't get houses because no one will give them a guarantor or no one will give them a house. So they can't can't find accommodations for themselves. They can't get a job because of the record. It's like every everywhere they go, they're getting knockbacks in it. When I came home, I was seriously considering becoming a prostitute. <laughs> I would, yeah. I can go on the game. <laughs> but I thought I've to be a little bit better than that. I was, I was going to be doing an evasive driving course, do the close body protection, what the boxing and such, a little bit of a silver service course, wine tasting. Obviously, I did my training, Rick, and thank you for your mention in your book, mate, and such. Yeah. Thank you very much, buddy. Um, and I thought I would advertise at that time. A lot of rich women were getting robbed and such in Knightsbridge in London. I mean, a woman got pulled off of a bus while she's holding on to a bag and she died from it, okay? It was a Louis Vuitton bag. But that gave me the idea to give protection to women that are coming over from the States, China, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. Have a nice car, nice Range Rover, big car, whatever. And provide a service for women that need protection or an escort or someone to chaperone them around. But I know if I'd have done that, I'd have ended up leading doing the horizontal shuffle. <laughs> and then I'd have got a little bit extra. <laughs> a little bit extra. I thought, prostitution, Kevin. Happy ending. <laughs> yeah, cool for that. So I didn't do it. But I'll joke in the side, I did think about it. Um, <laughs> it's actually a good idea. Like, it don't sound bad, I've got to tell you. <laughs> so, messing about. What about those people who've got no family? And we're not saying, oh, it's a sad sob story. What we have to think about is judge a country by how they treat their prisoners. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now our population's going up, prison population. Quite a diverse group that we've got in there now, which is causing multiples of problems which are going to ripple out into society so somebody really needs to get a grip of this country turn them boats back that are coming across the channel sending over rapists burglars murderers petty crime pretty much 80 percent of them that come over are young males of 21 up to 30 odd. I know because I do a food bank and I do a charity run every single week. I'm now handing out food to refugees that live in your four star hotels. Yeah. Women well, and children. Yeah. And then you've got as all well the as 
people living on the Sorry. streets. And then you've got all of our citizens that are living on the streets. I, I question it myself. I have to say, and I'm giving out food to these these poor souls. But it's a very difficult subject when you think I hand out food to the homeless who can't get a hotel room or are sleeping on the pavement. Yeah. And I think I'm giving out parcels of food as food banks to people in four-star hotels that aren't getting fed. That's why I'm having to give them food. They're giving food that they don't eat because they're Muslims or their faith doesn't have that or they're petty little, petty little meals. And they're bloody starving. So that's MP, an MP, uh, not sanctioned, but promoted us supporting them whilst they're in hotels because they're not getting fed what they should get fed. But there'll be many citizens that say, well, they shouldn't be here anyway. Yeah. But let's just not diverse here. Let's just look at the, the subject in, in the whole. We're talking about people being released from prison and what we should be doing for them. And we're not doing a great deal. I got let out of prison with 46 quid. And the probation officer says to me, you've got the wherewithal not to be sleeping on your friend's floor. Yeah. I've got no wherewithal. Where's my flat? I've been in 20 years. Give us a flat. I've owned properties. I bought my first house when I was 18. It's not like I'm a sponger. I'm a go-getter and a provider. I pay my taxes and such. Didn't pay him down for about 20 years, so, but <laughs> banged up. Nonetheless, what if I didn't have the friends and the get up and go to go and get a pal note and work my socks off seven days a week for first year? I think we should have one Sunday off a month. Yeah, one Sunday off a month for a year. More than that. But not everybody's already got that. So it's a constant cycle, isn't it? You get released, you go back in. You get released, you go back in. And you're going back in because you've got nothing to look forward to outside. What would you do, Rick, in the cold weather we just had if you were sleeping on the floor? you go and put a window through straight away, wouldn't you, and get in a police cell? You would. Like you see, if you're living on the streets, you've got nothing. There's a lot of people, that's why they're end up back in prison, because they're going to commit crimes to feed themselves or for somewhere to sleep. Yeah, yeah, it's sad, very sad. So uh, there's a lot of government land that's sitting there and it's been empty for years and years and years. And I've been in discussion, like I say, with an MP, and I've been saying, look, I'll provide social housing for these people and it can be moved. So I can provide real housing that is mortgageable and I've put these houses on wheels. That's what I've designed. Is that what you've so got? So you can move these houses about wherever you want. But nonetheless, we can provide housing for people that are sleeping on the streets, maybe causing crime, maybe causing disturbances with their begging, whatever. But let's get them off the streets and then let's get them into a community. Yeah. Whether they're prisoners or beggars, let's look at it collectively. And I feel that's what we should be doing for the likes of Charlie, by releasing them, and many others. So getting back to Ray, when you just mentioned getting back to Charlie, I think his parole hearings on Monday, is it? On the sixth. Yeah. Yeah. What do you What do you think will happen on that, and Kev? I haven't read the reports, so I know it's a hard one to judge on. But in my personal opinion, not that I know anything about the case or just off everything what everybody else knows and the documentary and everything. And with knowing a bit about the system, with them being in a unit, still can't be a prisoner, there's no chance of going to release them straight from there, are there? No. He'll have to have a release plan. I think it goes somewhere like Warren Hill. And what side is that? Uh, I can't see, or D? It's, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's a C cap, I believe, right. and it overrides a D cap. You get released from there, right? So it pre release it prepares you for release, and it's a, predominantly for lifers and people who've served a long time, right? Yeah, I don't feel Charlie should be going into the mainstream prison system. He was talking about putting him into Whitemore landings. Are they crazy? They're putting him, setting him up to fail if they put him there. It's just, it's 
you know, sometimes you think about their thought well, patterns. And I bet Mid- they need to get them. Not to backward step going back to dispersals, isn't it? You need to be progressing. Yeah, it does. I've had people from prison officers, former serving prison officers, who've read a couple of uh, messages that I've put up. They said, absolutely bang on, Kevin. You've got it absolutely right. Charlie needs to be put somewhere away from people uh, where he can lead the rest of his life. And he said, I was a serving prisoner officer when, he, when I started the job. And I've retired and Charlie's still in. He said, it isn't right. And that's from prison officers. Yeah. These are prison officers, Ricky, that you and I both know. And you think, thank God for them, because our lives could have made a hell of a lot worse if they'd have all been arseholes. Oh, absolutely. I Like you see, fucking, they're not all bad. Obviously, we've come across a lot of good screws inside. I've never screwed any, but I've, I've come across a few good screws. I've been minded screwing. <laughs> <laughs> During my 20 years, I said, you not me, baby. <laughs> but uh, respectively, yeah. I would never speak like that around a lady on the landing. You know, the ladies always just say, oh, Kevin's very polite and that, you know. <laughs> Joking aside, and I apologise to all you lady viewers. I'm only having a laugh. But, Yeah. Kev used Charlie. to put his best uh, clothes on on a Friday when he had a couple of drinks with the hooch to see the ladies on the on the landing, didn't you? <laughs> a bit of a dance. <laughs> bit of a bit of after shave on. <laughs> after shave on, polish his shoes. I was ready for anyone. <laughs> yeah, some good nights there. So, Charlie, he must be now. Go. I worry that if he gets the knockback what it will do to him. He's got to get some sort of progressive move out of it, at, at least, hasn't he? Because a lot, a lot of people out here, like viewers, they're all having debates who haven't really got a clue about it, thinking, oh, he's going to get released. He can't get released from a cat ear unit. Simple as that, isn't it? Yeah, because you haven't reduced your risk to society. You haven't reduced it. So when I was talking on, on what, the documentary for Charlie, and I was saying, look, if anybody gets in my face of hell of, of hurting me, then they ain't going to do that. Because I won't allow it, I will defend myself. And I am in society. But am I a violent man? No. But I can use force to defend myself if I need to. Yeah. Charlie can be the same. However, I would say Charlie needs time to adjust somewhat. He's either got to really be put in the middle of nowhere... Why, somewhere where he doesn't want to be put in a town centre, that's for sure, in a hostel. He can't be. That would never work. He's got to be released into someone's care. And that's someone who he can who can rely on to direct him and give him good advice for, in relation to the problems that they had when they first came home. Yeah. So I don't know if the probation and prison service are working with people outside other than being employed by the prison system. They should be looking at putting him somewhere where it could be managed in a manner where he's not going to be pestered yeah. and driven driven to something. Uh, I think he just wants to get on with his life, do a bit of painting, do a few talks. I don't think, everyone keeps saying about his violence, his violence. That and, and I, I've just been caught up in that myself there because we're we're judging Charlie on the old Charlie. Yeah. Let's have a look at the new Charlie and all that carry on where he's jumping up and down, start bollock naked. He didn't attack no one, did he? He just turned around and hit the deck <laughs> after they sprayed him. But he hit the deck anyway. He could have had a fight, but he didn't. Yeah. That's just showing that I'm making a protest, but I've not hurt no one. What else are you left to do when you're in that place other than bring attention to your problem? Unfortunately, that normally resides in results in violence or yeah. smashing up because nobody listens to you. Get behind the door or we're going to wrap you up. Simple. And having to deal with that for nearly 50 years takes a strong person, doesn't it? <laughs> The majority of people... I wouldn't couldn't deal with my old woman for two years, let alone <laughs> prison system for 50. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a difficult one. But there's a, there's a far lot worse people 
who haven't got the heart that he's got, the kind heart. He accepts he's been a problem here and there, but oops. look, you come into the prison system, you shouldn't be punished for the way they treat you and the way you react. To be a prison officer in England, I think it's training seven weeks. Yeah. Argentina's four years. Fucking hell. Why do we have to spray people with pepper spray when you could spray, spray a gas in the room? Room to make them go to sleep. Nice. Why do you have to have the violence? Pepper spray, rip your, cut your clothes off, you rip your clothes off, you whatever, zip tie your cuff, yeah, and then carry you like you're a dead deer. That's how I used to be carried by them, sods. And they used to touch me up and no bobbin, so nothing about that. <laughs> that was just a little bit extra for you. <laughs> yeah, but I'm extra. Hey, go on, get your finger out of my arse. I didn't say you could do that. <laughs> So <laughs> there's there's a way in which that I feel that the punishments in prison keep you in prison because I say you're being violent in prison, but it's run on violence, isn't it? As I said on there, but a lot um, of it as well. A lot of the prisoners, is like Charlie and a lot of the lads we've met, Kev, and a lot of the IPPs, they've got mental health problems. There's what about these? ADHD, autism, things like that, that's making these prisoners behave in such a way, but they're getting punished for it instead of treated. Yeah, it's that's fair comment, that. Well, Charlie was probably one of those. I mean, I wonder what he'd be diagnosed with now if it was 48 years forward and he just can't mean. Well, he probably had um, ADHD, hyperactive disorder. <laughs> he, he may have had something like that, Mick. Oh. I mean... Um, I, I don't know, but I know one thing's for sure. He was behaving in a manner that was obviously considered um, you weren't safe to be in society by purchasing shotguns. He accepts that. But if he'd been addressed as to why he was going to get shotguns as soon as he's released, instead of having a, a bricklaying company to go to work with, with the lads having a crack and a laugh, all right, on a brick on a building site, Bit more robust for him in the fresh air, cold, having a you know, egg and bacon and whatever, right? He's had none of that. <clears throat> Whereas, tell me this, Ricky, how many prisons have you been in where you, you know they've got the appropriate training facilities for the amount of prisoners they've got in there? None. None. I've been in five prisons all in the northeast, and they've got nothing like that. So I've got a few friends who have been armed robbers and such in the past. One of them, I was only 14 when he got banged up with my mate's dad. He was banged up in Norway. He had a phone in his cell then. He used to have, uh, he was allowed to have a lady of the night come in every so often, but you had to have behaved for that. You didn't get that privilege if you didn't behave. Your family could come in over a weekend, and they stayed in quarters like a bungalow type in the grounds for the whole weekend that kept family ties together yeah so you were not going off having three or four kids with different men <laughs> as a result of husbands not being allowed home or you're not being allowed yeah. to have your contact with them that was blimey 30 odd years ago way ahead of us we seem to be doing things very wrong still and my one of that that friend of mine that we're talking about there in norway and two further friends of mine who were armed robbers. He was a drug dealer, that friend of mine. Uh, my friend's dad, actually. Well, he got 30 years, like I say. It was like the craze seven years ago. Um, and that was up like, in Norway, was it? Up in Norway, yeah. yeah. So I'm just trying to shut this screen. So they all learned skills. So, so two of them become plasterers. And the other one went into gardening. Can you see me, Rick? Yeah, I can see you, mate. Everything's clear. So, uh, yeah, went into gardening, and the other one become plasterers. Never went back to prison. So they've got a trade for when they come out to get straight into a job, which makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, one of them went on to be a lorry driver. He knew, he knew, uh, now delivers diesel or petrol in them big tankers. He's got, he's got, he's had a child. He's 
happily married. He's got a business in Spain, a restaurant. Um, the other one suffers, uh, tragically died. Uh, and the other one's got a nice little life in the gardening realm. But they had, they were, they had, they were trained in skills. Counting how many screws go in a packet in a workshop isn't training you. Some of the workshops in this country might have 12 or 15 people in a workshop learning plastering or painting. Where's the, like Taylor Woodrow, where's the infrastructure that should be set up in place to take these people on? The company that I'm currently talking to <clears throat> and going into JV and joint ventures with me, we're looking at employing prisoners because prisoners are the most reliable. They don't let you down. At a work rate and percentages of turning up, they have proven to be the most reliable coming out of C and D cat prisons. Right. Oh, but just goes to show, doesn't it? Because obviously they don't want to. They don't want to go back over, do they? They're gonna make the most of it. They don't want to go back to prison. They want to get out of that prison every day and work and enjoy it. Yeah. Okay, and that's what we're looking to do. There are other Blantyre House and DCAP prisons do that now. Um, I would like to look at it a little bit closer and get them into it from CCAP prisons. Yeah. Uh, but that, that, that's another discussion. But right. At this country at the moment, we're lacking in many areas, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah but, like, you, like you see, the, if they're not going to give any of them sort of facilities, they should put the money into building better facilities in the prisons to train them up instead of, you know, yourself. It's like most prisons is 23 hour lockdown, lying on your bed all day. That's why you, I'm... Mate, you, were, you were always on the rope, wouldn't you? You, you were always <laughs> like, oh, read, me a, read me a story from the <laughs> read, a, read me a story out the window, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I never had Razzle, by the way. Never. Hey, <laughs> boy. <laughs> so yeah them poor blighters in there now what they're going through but there's not the same prisons as when we were last left Ricky I know it's, really? uh, totally changing aren't they it's they hard, seem to be getting worse all the time was there death, a death is always in the air in the high security estate Rick isn't it it is it's a dangerous place isn't it very dangerous you, you become accustomed to it because you're living it yeah you go on a roller coaster ride every day of your life. Soon you'll be going to sleep on it. You, you could, you know, you get so used to it. Pretty much like the prison system, isn't it? You don't get used to it. You just become numb to it. But in them high security prisons, obviously, I've only done Franklin. You've obviously done the majority of them. It's not very often things happen, but when it does kick off, it kicks off big style. And it's like the violence that's happening in there is fucking. Well, people's trying to kill you, aren't they? If they're after you. Oh, stab you, foil on you. You know, oh, it's atrocious. It's very, very worrying to be truthful with you. I wouldn't want to go back into that system now. Like the, uh, what man? What same man would? Chucking pans of hot oil over people, fucking gay. It's terrible, isn't it? I'll tell you what I'll do now, mate. If I went in there and it was on TV the other week, and I've been telling people this since I come home. If I ever I got a long sentence again, I don't anticipate me getting a long sentence, but just hypothetically speaking. Yeah. I'd get myself a pair of tits and I'd get over the woman's knee. <laughs> be alive, would. wouldn't it? Oh, do be banged up with you women. <laughs> I'd get in the married quarters, wouldn't I? <laughs> give yourself the chop. <laughs> well, no, they would give you a pill now to stop you getting the old bono. <laughs> yes. Sitting, well, sitting be... Newton next door to Franklin. <laughs> I'll be like, I'll be snugged up to a nice brassy air. <laughs> that's the way this country's going they're letting you say I want to be identified as Amy now and I'm going over the woman's neck well, <laughs> you know they seem to be putting more money into that than they do rehabilitation <laughs> quackers I think there's been a one recently that was in the press up in there I'm sure it was up in Scotland that's right it was mentioned there uh, was it a man sent over to the woman's prison yeah no. Yeah. I think he's heard one of my podcasts in the past. Because <laughs> I've been saying it for a few years. <laughs> it might have been that James yeah. English one that you're on up in Scotland. Yeah? <laughs> I've done another one with James recently. So uh, that'll be out, I think, next week or so. 
I've got some good podcasts coming up to do with mental, mental health and such. And so I've been working with a few charities and that, and I'm doing some mental health work. Um, I do mental health every day with my girlfriend, but this is a bigger project. So <laughs> we're going to do some uh, mental health podcasts with a little bit more charity work and a little bit more fun type stuff rather than yeah. the, the the violence and the aggressive and, 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 and such. But well, I'm a big uh, ambassador for mental health up in my gym. I'm up in my gym now. I've got my own little room here where they do the podcasts and stuff. But in the other room next door to me, gym, I've set up a room for a, a men's mental health group because there's that, there's too many people in the area committing suicide to. My best friend's done it. So I've set this group up for free and it's for men over the age of 18 who just come in, all sit together and just talk to each other. People can open up if they want to, but getting some great feedback from it. So... It's good just to give a little bit of bag in it. Listen, mate, um, if you communicate with uh, my PA and she will get something in the diary, I'll come up and I'll Absolutely, come to mate. one of your meetings. Yeah, right? love that, mate. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to do that. Uh, you know, you save one life or put a couple on the straight in now. You know what, though, Rick? Thank God we can turn the flip side and laugh about the sadness of what you're actually doing. And it's great, fair play to you, Rick, mate. You've nice come work. out, you've turned your life around and you're a product of society, you are now. And you're doing good in society. Yeah. And, you know, I'll tip my hat to you, mate. And if I can do anything to help you, then please, just ask. Buddy. You made a nice one. But yeah. again, I'm another one of them. Same sort of sentence as Charlie, like yourself, IPP. Kind of really, even though you're doing well with your life, you've still got this hanging on you. Where for the rest of your life until they fit, see fit to take it away from you, and it just feels like a constant drain on your back. Well, like I say, I risk assess now where I go and what I do hmm. in terms of do I go to a football match? Who's playing? Is that team a bit rowdy? Have they had a fight? The last time they played, did it kick off there? That may seem mad to some people. Look, say Newcastle played West Ham, and there was a massive fight. Then them supporters want a bit of re, uh, retaliation yeah. on the next game. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go to that. If there was a kickoff at that game, the previous game, I wouldn't go. And it's that type of research that I have to do. Who they plan, what the crowd's like. And, then, you know, well, I should say I shouldn't have to lead my life like that, but unfortunately... I, I do. Yeah, you Kev, like you've, you've got to, haven't you? Because otherwise you could end up in a situation... When you've just mentioned there about the football, yeah, there's a couple of lads that I know went down to Wembley at the weekend, Newcastle against Man U, and as they were coming out, they hadn't been drinking, they were walking out, and they seen some Newcastle fan getting his head booted all over off two Man U lads, and one of them went to intervene, and they all got roped in with a big brawl. If you were in that situation, the police came, we'd end up in prison, where everybody else would get off with a caution. Very sad. I noticed that, as Charlie will have, because of his name, the first thing that I have when I've been spoken to police is they see an army. Uh, they, they do a check on me. And as soon as the check comes up, I've had, I would deal with this man. Comes over with a fucking inspector or, you know, a sergeant or chief inspector who's on whatever reason. This happened uh, a few years ago. And I was away with some friends of mine. And it was an area that was predominantly white. And my friend is 68, actually. So he's a senior. And he's a quiet man, very quiet. And, but because he's, he's ethnicity, the doorman from a country that, not in the UK, that worked there, they were very known. Um, and they started on him. Uh, this moved outside, and I won't go into what happened outside, but the police were called and people were pinned to the ground. If it wasn't for the decency of members of the public coming forward and saying, them doormen there, for no reason whatsoever, started on that man. Started on him, all right. And if it wasn't for the, 
the decency of them people, my friend and my other friend, and possibly me, because I was make I was objecting to what went on myself yeah. to the police. Um, may have been taken to the police station. As it was, I wasn't. I was let go. But the police officer, when he did a check on me, the inspector came over and said, I'll, I'll be handing this man here. Took me to the side. Yeah. Uh, I was very lucky that evening. Um, my friends were very lucky because he could have gone the other way. And was but he big bear with you, the copper? Oh, he was. I'm over the moon. He goes, yeah. he goes, listen, I'll deal with this gentleman. He said, me, call me a gentleman. He said, okay, sir, can you tell me what's happened, please? I said, these people here said, have taken an absolute liberty with that gentleman over there mm. because of his colour. And they've run him out the door for no reason. And I've seen that man saying, please, all these gestures. Then they put his hands in me he said, take your hands off me. You've got the wrong person. They just wanted him out of the club. And then these girls came forward and there's quite a few people protesting for my friend, actually, which really, really, it, it took me took me back, really. But if it wasn't for the decency of the members of the public, my friend who had a criminal record, who is 68 now, he's the gentleman I told you about, the gardener. Right, yeah. Okay. But he's, yes, please, no, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness me, he's a Jamaican, but he talks really, really soft. Rock. He's, a, yeah. he's got a bit of a lift and he's really quiet. Um, if it wasn't for his criminal record, he may have had a different side to that effect. But because he had a criminal record, it would have gone one way if members of the public hadn't stepped in. So with Charlie's reputation, he's going to have problems where is, is he going to need crowd control? Is he going to need security to manage the crowd? Where he goes, someone, yes, he will. Yeah. He will need a, t a couple of lads who can keep people at back, save and putting their hands on him, slapping him around the face. You get some drunk, do all sorts of madness. I'm not saying he's going to be party to that, but you just have to take precautions that when he does guest speeches, say at Cambridge or Oxford, and I've done speeches, I've done, I was guest speecher at quite a few universities now. Yeah. Um, Charlie may be asked to, to attend them. And if he is, he's going to have to have the appropriate people around him to, to take care of him and safeguard members of the public for get, getting themselves in trouble where they ought not to. Oh, of course, because it's going to, it'll cause weight, a bit of a, a bit of a stir amongst people who want it, people trying to roll Jack Rick, because you will get the people that's going to come along and try and cause a fuss and try and kick up a stink, try and cause a bit of aggro. So tell me, I see a, a clip about, it says Bronson versus... Um, Sykes. Sykes. Is that is that referring to a straightener or is that referring oh, no. to what that video is here? I don't know that video referring to Bronson and Sykes, and it wasn't talking about who's the hardest out of the pair of them because I wouldn't do anything like that because it's just fucking stupid, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of people talk about that, but um, I was just referring to the two lives, like Charlie's life. He spent fifty years in prison. Sykes, he spent twenty odd years in prison. Got out. Ended up being homeless, died an alcoholic on the streets. Uh, Charlie's life, he spent 50 years in prison. And a lot of the youngsters and even people in prison who I've met are looking up to the likes of these two wanting to be like them. And I'm saying, like, why would you want to be like Sykesy, who's been in prison for 20 odd years, ended up on the streets, an alcoholic? And everyone that wants to be like Bronson, they want to go and do crazy shit and spend 50 years in prison. What sort of mentality is that to be in? They, they haven't done the bird yet, though, Rick, have they? Wait till exactly. they've got to do the bird in the strip cells or whatever they've got to do it. Yeah. And the sadness that they've had to be party to, it's just... Um... But it, did you ever come across Sykes? No, I come across his son. Oh, I, we met him in here. He was in Franklin, wasn't he? Yeah, he's, he's a pest. Yeah. Well, I've done a, I've done a video on him, where because obviously when I was in Franklin, I see him when he got stabbed in the neck with a coffee jar. Nick the geezer's tobacco. Yeah. It was, a pep it was a hot pepper bottle and he had it taped to his hands. I forget the fella's name now. The kid had been in, in, in an, uh, he was handed over to an orphanage from hospital. <clears> so he'd been in care since he was a child. Nice kid. So actually went and nicked his, or Sharpie, the fella's name, isn't it? Sharpie? Sharpie, that's the one I. He went and nicked his tobacco and he was taking people's dinners out of their cells. He's now converted to Islam. Yeah, so. He he had his own problems in the system, yeah. Uh, with some uh, 
certain factions. He's now converted to Islam. I find that somewhat convenient rather than that's what he's done. Yeah. He said, I'll, I'll see him. Anyway, that's what he's done. But I have to wonder if his father's life had a bearing on how he's been. Well, did he see the documentary on sites that he'd done years and years ago when he was in, no. I think he was in Strange Ways? Um, and he had his two sons with him and he was quite strict with them. And he was, seemed like a bit of a nasty piece of work with his kids. But both of his son have ended up committing murder and being lifers now. And they both of them. I knew what I didn't know he had yeah. to. That's another conversation that. Yeah. Is, uh, I was there when that happened. Well, we were both there, weren't we, were in Franklin Dam? Because I remember at the time, obviously, the way he was going on on the wing, bullying people. Like, people aren't going to stand for that sort of thing in prison, other than they are. I'll tell you what he did. This is a story that I've never mentioned on a podcast. And I remember a couple of fellas come to me. I don't talk to one of the fellas now. He's, he's a real bad junkie, but he bad mouthed me when I left the prison system. Didn't bad mouth when I was there, but bad mouthed me. You always get someone, you can't get on with everybody. And someone will always not like you because you're liked or because you've done things they can't do. You know what I mean, Rick. Yeah, of course. So he was he was going into people's cells and this fella came to me, he said, Kevin, he keeps coming in my cell in the morning. I'm naked in bed and he keeps laying on top of me. He was doing other things to people that some of the lads were coming to me saying, and I said, no, God, I was just at the time fighting my cut to come out of the dispersion. He around and said to or sharp, he said to me, have you heard what people are saying about me, Kevin? I said, I have. And if you don't keep treading on people's toes, you're going to get your stamps on. And it was in like a walkway, like a, kind of, a lion's walkway, you know, coming out into the circus. And he's, he's a big bloke, isn't he? Oh, he's and a big old lumbo. He's doing like 220 key bench press and silly amounts of squats and all the rest of it. But I was doing 100 key bench press dumbbells. 10 sets of 10 at the time. I was the strongest heck wick, wasn't I, you know, from my weight, 13 and a half stone. Yeah. But I was a strong 13 and a half stone. I could be strong for long. But you think, you get 100 key in your face, you ain't standing up, right? And he knew that. And, I, and he's looking at me, right? And I thought, oh, fuck that, so. I had to say something because the lads have said something to me. And I'm yeah. not going to say nothing. <laughs> when he's asked me, and I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, if he makes one wrong move, I'll hit him that many times he'll think he's surrounded. <laughs> he looked at me and I walked on. I thought, oh, fucking hell, that was a result. <laughs> <laughs> that, he's a big old lump, isn't he? Like, he's pull your bleeding head off, wouldn't he? He didn't get, get into him a bit lively. <laughs> you know, and that was me in the legal system. Yeah. And I'm glad to be out of it and lead a normal life, a law abiding citizen. Just go. And, do you know what, Rick? If, if people was to be on my shoulder and feel me when I go out of my door, through the course of the day, and you know me, Rick, yeah. through the course of the day, I will interact with people I do not know, I'll have conversations with them, and I will have a laugh with them. Of course, yeah. Absolute strangers. Am I a menace to society? Or am I someone society would like to have out here? Knowing that I'll do more good than I've ever done bad, and I'll be straight at someone's aid if I thought they needed it. Well, you're a valued member of society, aren't you? You're out there doing good for people. You're trying to help prisoners, ex-prisoners. So, trying to. You're doing good, aren't you? Like the hand, handing out the food to the home. I don't want to be seen like a, you know, a bloody do-gooder and that. But oh, I need to do my life, and I'm happy with my life. Uh, <clears throat> and I hope Charlie can have the same. Awfully, definitely. He's so, got it, yeah. For all of you out there, keep, keep looking at Fitted Up and Fighting Back, and TikTok and Instagram. And I'll be talking to the company that I'm going to be working with uh, in relation to getting him somewhere to live and setting up a charity for that. And this is a multi-million pound company. So uh, watch out for this over the next few weeks. Uh and if you want to contribute a quid, two quid, whatever, please do. Don't go in my pocket. And there'll be a spreadsheet for all the costs of what that house cost down to the penny. Yeah. There'll be no money going in my pocket from it. 
That's all. So, that's well, what I'll do as well, Kev, I'll put all the yeah, I'll put all the links in the description of this video. So if people want to go down and follow Kev's channels and uh, get behind him, follow all his stuff that he's doing. Thank you, thank you. I look forward to that. I'm going to be coming up with you. Speak to my PA. Yeah. All right. He flirts with you. Let me know. <laughs> well, what we'll do, Kev, yeah. I know. I'll get... What we'll do is obviously when you do come up, we, uh, we'll get you in this room. We'll do another podcast. Do a podcast face to face. Talk a bit more in depth about yourself, your upbringing, and everything. Yeah. Let the viewers have a. A look at your your story. I know they might have seen you on the other podcast, but obviously I do things a little bit different on my podcast. I might answer ask questions a bit differently. We've spent time together in prison, so I think people find it a bit more. No, no, I don't want to talk about when <laughs> I don't want to talk about what happened. Talk about the showers between me and you. <laughs> Listen, I don't always talk to people like this. <laughs> You can see who was. I would like that. You can see who was the giver. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Daddy. <laughs> uh, at least we can laugh, folks. You know. That's it, I. Laugh. If you didn't laugh, Nick, you cry. <laughs> oh, you buddy, I really crying. appreciate your thick, buddy. Yeah. Rick, I don't mean to cut it short, buddy, but I'm actually no excited. So. so me, it's been interesting. Talk me a nice one. Appreciate it. Oh, Rick, I've loved talking to you, mate. It's like, you know, Ricky, you're, yeah. you're such a good soul, mate. That's nice the, one. That's the, all was, you people yeah. don't really know him. He was the real quiet man in prison, polite and respectful. Yeah. Didn't bother no one. And uh, that's what you got there, real gentleman. Nice one. Thanks a lot, Kev. Cheers, mate. All right, buddy. And God bless nice you one. and the family, Rick. And I'll be in touch, mate. Nice one. You as well, mate. Take care. Take care, buddy. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye.